Yeah, well, tell me more about the title, the subtitle. The there, title was nothing more. It reflected the fact that there was a quote from John McCain, who I really liked. And if John McCain could call himself a bit player, well, then certainly I'm a bit player. And that somehow reflected where I was. And, and so you ask me, who's a bit? Well, put player is the one who plays the piano in, in Casablanca. It's not the main actor, but it's someone on the side. But usually on the side, that's important. Mm -hmm. And that sort of turned out to be where I was at the number of... And it's really sort of unusual how seldom I looked for a job. I mean, it was somebody else asking for me. And, and, and as I point out, all I really wanted to do was write books and have enough money to write books. Mm -hmm. And even that happened by accident. Right. Steve Hess didn't plan to have such a fascinating career at the heart of American politics, power, and intellectual inquiry. But quite by accident, it turned out that way. I'm Katie Dunn Tempest, a visiting fellow and director of the Katzman Initiative at the Brookings Institution, and a practitioner senior fellow at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. From his childhood in New York City, to the Army in Germany, to his service with Presidents Eisenhower and Nixon, his friendship with Daniel Patrick Moynihan and others, Steve has been living an amazing life. And whether it was by accident, or as a bit player, doesn't take anything away from his important contributions to our civic life. In this final episode of Quite by Accident, he'll share some of his stories after he left the Nixon White House in 1972, which begin with a longtime dream to join the Brookings Institution as a scholar. But you'll also see him once again advising U.S. presidents in a different capacity. So how did Steve come to be a senior fellow at Brookings? It was 1972. He had run the White House conferences on youth and children and had been put forward to head the National Endowment for the Humanities, which didn't pan out. So I go back to the president at that point and I've, oh, excuse me, so I've sort of run out of things I want to do. In the meantime, the Brookings Institution the president has come to me and asked if I would like to be join Brookings. Oh, this is what a marvelous offer. This is really what I really wanted all my life. But I mean, how could I get that when all those people have PhDs and so forth and so on? But by now, uh, I'm sort of a celebrity. Mm -hmm. And Kermit Gordon said... Kermit Gordon, Brookings Institution president from 1967 to 1976. Yeah, we'd love to have you. You could either be my vice president uh, or a senior fellow. Well, I didn't come there to be a vice president of anything. I said, oh, sure, I'd love to be a senior fellow. So I've been there for 50 years. It's been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Wow. Sorry. In 1974, Gerald Ford became president when Richard Nixon resigned. Steve first met Ford in the 60s when he was a congressman from Michigan. I had, oh, I had written some speeches for him when he was made the, the Republican the leader of the House. So, January 1965. Mm -hmm. And it was really strange because I didn't know him at that time. But he was going to give a big speech at the National Press Club, and I was called in to write it. So I quickly had to look up to see who the blazes this guy, his background. And I found out uh, that he had been a big football star at, at uh, Michigan. At, at Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I needed a joke to start the thing. So I had to say, uh, uh, I, for him, he says, Imagine, I, I imagine where I would be today if I had accepted Curly Lambeau's offer to play for the Green Bay Packers. And then I instruct him, pause, and say, perhaps on the Supreme Court. Now, there's something that most people here don't, don't remember, but the President of the United States, John Kennedy, had just put uh, a Supreme Court justice had been just appointed a Supreme Court justice, uh, Wizard White, who had been a great football player for ah. Colorado. That would be Byron White, a star halfback at the University of Colorado, where he got the nickname Wizer, and led the NFL in rushing yards in 1938. President Kennedy appointed him to the Supreme Court in 1962 where he served until his retirement in 1993. Uh, so the, the, the connection, where would I be, pause, perhaps on the Supreme Court. Everybody in that audience at the National Press Club knew what I was talking about. Right. So somehow, in fact, um, 
Jerry Ford, I think, I heard, liked my jokes more than he liked my speeches, but I wrote some speeches for him, so I knew him. And so, in the mid-70s, while Steve was at Brookings, President Ford offered Steve two short-term jobs. First, as U.S. representative to UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Think World Heritage Sites and its other activities to promote peace and security. And second, delegate to the UN General Assembly, where Steve delivered a speech. But I should say, particularly, I really liked Ford. I, I have a special feeling for president who got there without running for it, Harry Truman, Jerry Ford. There, there's a, there was a decency that somehow I felt they lose these guys who go through the whole process mm -hmm. of running around the United States looking for vote. And they, they stayed simple and nice, I thought. So at any rate, he sends me to UNESCO in Paris, which is certainly nice being in Paris. Um, I learned something there. I learned never tell a joke in a in a situation where it's being multi-translated. Oh. It really loses it by the time you, you've got to the audience and nobody is laughing. So that's what I that's what I learned in UNESCO. <laughs> I also learned that it was a rotten operation at that time. The, the head of it was, if not corrupt, certainly inefficient. And, and the U.S. at that point then. Uh, decided it would pull its money out. And I was totally in favor of that. We had to put the screws on them to get back in shape, which we did. So that was basically my experience with UNESCO. The U.S. formally pulled out of UNESCO under President Reagan in 1984, rejoined in 2003 under President George W. Bush, pulled out again in 2018 under President Trump, and rejoined under President Biden in the summer of 2023. But then in, in 76, the election year, when he sent me to New York <clears throat> to the General Assembly, that, that turned out to be its, its own type of disappointment. The, the ambassador was, 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 was Scranton, former governor of Pennsylvania, such a nice man. And he promised me that, oh, I'm so delighted you're going to be here you know, and uh, we're going to do great things. What, what the U.S. had, which virtually no other nation had, was they said to, people who were not diplomats to, to, to a general assembly. And that would be a, a, a congressman, or a member of the House of Representatives uh, in odd number years, because they were always running in even number years, or a senator in even number years. So the senator they sent with, with me was, was uh, <laughs> Baker, Howard Baker. Howard Baker. Yeah, he was great. So yeah. Yeah, Howard Baker said to me, uh, "It's like your 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 mother saying, uh, uh, go out and let me know when you've got a job because we have so little to do.' But at any rate, I, I took it seriously. Uh, I, I made recommendations. Uh, we had a situation where uh, the, uh, the 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 Arab, the Saudi Arabian ambassador, had a, a very interesting proposal uh, on using the taxes on, uh, on on weapons to pay for the UN. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a nice idea. Maybe it wouldn't work, but let's throw it out. They wouldn't let me support that. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you another, know why? That's the State Department. They, they, we have a policy, and you're telling us something that's not our policy. Another time, they were really rough at blocking uh, Israel uh, from something that they had every right to. And I said, let's walk out on this hearing. Oh, no, well, no, that's, that's, at any rate, I was not in sync with the State Department. Then everybody over the group uh, of outsiders uh, gets one major speech to give. In front of the UN? Yeah. And oh. that's sort of exciting. You're standing up there with the way you've always seen people standing up there yeah. and so forth, and you're giving a speech, and it's very exciting. The problem was the speech they gave me was U.S. policy on apartheid in, in South oh. Africa. And I got this speech, and I didn't like it at all. And I started to rewrite the speech, and they started. They wouldn't take that at all. And finally, they and, and, and that thing went on and on because why is the U.S. talking? Well, we don't know why the U.S. is talking because they weren't talking because they, they wouldn't accept what I was giving. And they finally said, "Oh no, no, Henry is Kissinger has already approved this and so forth." Uh, uh, and I figured, well, I've got to give the speech. 
uh, I represent the uh. United States, not myself. Moreover, this is a presidential election year. I can't be standing up there and saying, you know, Jerry Ford thinks something otherwise. So I get up and I give the speech. And then I do something that I had no right in the world to do. I said, well, I'd like to say a few words of my own. Oh. <laughs> they were modest words, but they were on my own. No and hook came out and pulled you off the stage? More than that. <laughs> nobody in the world noticed. The press didn't notice. The U.S. delegations didn't notice. The State Department didn't notice. I was talking to that. At, at the world and saying some things about how what the U.S. should think about apartheid and nobody listened. Did it, did it get transcribed in the formal remarks that you eventually I, got I never went and looked. I don't know. I guess it oh. did. Yeah. Did you dodge a bullet, do you think? Like, would you have been reprimanded? No, I don't, nobody ever talked to me about it again. It was just huh. one of the stupid things I did in my life. In my life. Uh -huh. so it probably that reflected all the frustration you had with those drafts, right? Oh, I, I, yeah, that's right. I mean, he gave me a speech to give, and I, I'm apartheid of all things, and I wasn't happy with it. And you disagreed with it. With it yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I, my changes, it wasn't if I was turning was policy around. I couldn't do that, but I could make it otherwise, yeah. and then I couldn't get away with yeah. it. One of the biggest controversies of the Nixon resignation and ascension of Ford to the presidency was Ford's pardon of Nixon. Whether Ford should have done so is a question that still resonates today. I asked Steve if he agreed with the pardon. Did you have an opinion at the time? I thought he was time? right. I, okay. I was one of the few people who went on television and say, I thought I was right. This man is has just had the biggest pardon, the biggest punishment anybody could have. He's just lost the presidency of the United States. That's fine with me. That's mm -hmm. punishment enough. So that I felt strongly about that. So, 1976, the presidential election pitted Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter against now incumbent President Gerald Ford, who you will recall came to be president because after Spiro Agnew resigned, Nixon picked Ford from the House of Representatives to be his vice president. And then Nixon resigned, elevating Ford to the Oval Office. It was a pretty close election. Carter with just over 50% of the vote and 297 electoral college votes to Ford with 48% and 240 electoral votes. The Nixon resignation scandal was certainly a weight on the Republican ticket. And once again, Steve Hess was in the middle of national politics. Then I'm at the UN, and what happens there is I'm sitting at the UN, and he's lost, and I'm still sitting at the UN, and the secretary comes to my office and says, uh, Governor Carter is on the line. And I look up and say, Governor Carter? I, I don't think I know a Governor Carter. And a light bulb. I said, you mean that Governor Carter? And she nods. And that was a moment when Jimmy Carter was still carrying his own suitcase, uh -huh. you know, and making his own calls. And he calls me, and he had read my book on organizing the presidency. Uh, and he wants me to go to the White House and figure out what's going wrong. And so, and what time of year is this? This is this is right after the election. So the, it's the, the transition. Day, yeah, the day after the election. And so, um, the chief of staff at the White House, Dick Cheney. Mm -hmm. So I call and say, Governor Carter has just spoken to me, and so I'm getting on a plane, and I'll see you tomorrow morning. And so basically you wanted to get the download from Dick Cheney about how they ran the White House? Exactly. So I flew to New York the next yeah. day, met with Dick Cheney. And this, this is the way the world worked before uh, Donald Trump wouldn't even let anybody in. Dick Cheney had just lost the, his man had just lost the election. But he sat all morning telling me things that had to be fixed, mm -hmm. had to be changed. And I listened and I took notes. And I sent them right to Carter, and I said, well, according to Dick Cheney, you could get rid of 77 people here and there and so forth. But um, it was, it was, a, it was a, interesting because mm -hmm. the people that came in, with one exception, uh, from Georgia had never been even in the White House. I can remember uh, one coin said saying that I've been Brookings, uh, I've just been appointed staff secretary, no cabinet secretary. And I said, well, come over tomorrow. It's a Saturday. Come over to Brookings, where Steve was a senior fellow. I got a, a, a 
room at the blackboard. I drew, I drew a, a, a rectangle. I said, okay, this is the cabinet room. X, that's where the president sits. X, that's where the vice president sits. He didn't know any of that. Yeah. I was telling, so that's what it was like. He was a very nice man. He ultimately yeah. did very well. But so I, I was, I, I was in a position to help them for a while at right. least. Uh, so Jimmy Carter, interestingly, he sought your advice. He read your book about organizing the presidency, mm -hmm. but he refused to appoint a chief of staff and create that position at the beginning of his presidency. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's Did right. you try to correct him on no, that? No, 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 he, uh, you know, I, he was president of the United States. I wasn't correcting mm -hmm. him on things like that. Uh, more than that, I was responding to the questions they had. Uh, should the international trade representative be a separate organization or should it be in the Treasury Department or something like that? And I would say, oh, leave it where it is. It's working pretty well. That was the sort of thing we were talking about. Okay. And another strange thing happened. Um, Pat Moynihan had just been elected United States Senate. So unbeknownst to Dick Cheney, and, and Pat, and Carter was calling me and, and and Pat Moynihan writes him a letter and says, uh, I think I think you should hire S Steve Hess. And this is perfect for me because I don't want to be hired, but I have an excuse now to say, I I'm sorry, I'm not available. Mm -hmm. So Moynihan, uh, Carter acknowledges the letter. Oh, Steve Hess is doing great things. When it comes around to hiring people, I'll certainly talk about Steve Hess. And I write him a letter and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I really... Uh, I'm not interested in going back to the government. Although it wasn't quite fear. I stayed as a consultant on the for a short time, month or two, on the reorganization of the White House. So I did get a little paycheck. Steve just kept intersecting with famous people. In 1977, he chaired a panel for a conference at Harvard in honor of the Kennedy Fellows Program. He had been a fellow a decade earlier. And at the conference, Steve had a delightful encounter with the former First Lady, Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. It was the conference I at Harvard. I became a, a, a Kennedy Fellow at Harvard. It was a program that had been set up in honor uh, of John Kennedy. Uh, and there were about five of us who were Kennedy Fellows. Uh, and on the 10th anniversary of that program, they were going to have a big deal at, at Harvard. It was going to be something where on a Saturday morning we there were going to be panels in, throughout the Harvard uh, business, uh, Harvard uh, dormitories, and then we would have lunch and a picnic, and then that night there would be a big dinner and dance. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jonathan Moore, who ran the program, had asked if I would chair one of those panels. I said, sure. Uh, and the panel was on political parties. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got to, uh, to Harvard uh, uh, Friday night, and he gave me the list of, and it was a terrific list uh, of uh, former, uh, former governors, people who were going to be governors, people who were important, liberals, mm -hmm. uh, Al Lowenstein, people who were important conservatives. He had really done a good job of putting together the panel. And when I get to the bottom of the list, it's Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And I gasp. I say, I call him immediately. I say, what's what? What's this? What are you doing to me? Jeff, well, I, and he, I said, this is not political. This is not social parties. It's political parties. What is she? <laughs> and he says that on the senior advisory committee, which he is on, we put one member from that committee on each of these panels, and we have given her to you. And he stops that. I have no recourse. That's it. So the next morning, of course, the, the, the it's jammed in our, in our, I guess, I don't know who went to any of the other panels because it was announced that Jacqueline Kennedy was going to be on, on my panel. And she's not there. We start, so I start the discussion. Well, she's a no-show. So, so she's a no-show, and, and I start uh -huh. the, the program. Ten o'clock is set, ten to twelve, uh, and I give each person on the panel a chance to state what their position is, hoping that they'll give a long statement that'll go on and on. And they do. So after about twenty twenty-five minutes, she she shows up, 
and I greet her, and I put her in the, the one empty seat at the end. And remember, she is uh, uh, an editor at, at Doubleday. Okay. Uh, has, a, has a job. At, uh, and, and she's married to Aristotle Onassis well, at this that, point. That too, but uh -huh. but it's more. And so I said to her, uh, welcome, uh, Mrs. Uh, you haven't heard the other speakers, so it would be unfair to ask you to give an introductory remark not having heard the other. And she nods, that's right. So the, the, the discussion goes on. She says not a word, and it's now just about 12 o'clock. So I turn to Mrs. Onassis, and I say, well, now you've heard the discussion, you're a well-known editor, would you give us a contract? Mm -hmm. And she says, yes. In that whispery dainty, voice. dainty little voice she has, she says, yes. And the audience goes crazy, yes, yes, yes. And I said, that, and the, the, the session is over, and everybody laid. So we got away with her saying one word, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't know what she would have said. Steve also contributed his experience to Hollywood. Remember the movie Nixon, directed by Oliver Stone, starring Anthony Hopkins? It came out in 1995, and although it didn't do well at the box office, it garnered four Oscar nominations. Turns out, Steve had a part to play in it because of his relationship with Richard Nixon. Oh, that was strange because it turns out Oliver Stone wrote a, uh, directed a movie about uh, Nixon after having a very famous one that he did about uh, about uh, Kennedy's assassination, and it happens that my daughter-in-law, whose name is is, uh, is Levitt, is, is Heidi Levitt, is a very well-known uh, casting director, uh, and she. Uh, producer as well and and she was going to cast the movie the, the Oliver Stone movie she did a lot of Oliver Stone movies and she and we were in Los Angeles to see my grandchildren and she said would I would I meet with Oliver Stone sure why not so I went over uh, to his uh, office in Santa Monica uh, and we discussed uh, situation for a little while. And I don't remember much about it at that meeting. It wasn't, he wasn't, didn't seem to be interested enough. But as I'm leaving, I turned to him and I said, did you know that Nixon was in Dallas? And his eyes lit up and he said, was he on the knoll? <laughs> the grassy knoll. The grassy knoll. Uh -huh. Yeah. He also said, "Could could we meet, talk again sometime?" Yeah. And I said, "Oh, sure. Call me when you're in Washington, sort of thing." So sure enough, he calls at some point, uh, and I said, "Okay, um, what well, you can? I'll, I'll get a, a, a I need one of our rooms at the at Brookings, and have a session with you." Where did I go and look? So at Oliver it? Stone's comes to Brookings. Oliver Stone comes to Brookings. Uh, I make it clear with him that this is a private thing, and he agrees, oh, it's private, of course, it's private. I get a, pri I get a private dining room, and I bring uh, with, uh, with me Len Garment, who had been his law partner in New York, uh, John Sears, who was one of his political advisors, Ron Ziegler, who was his press secretary. Uh, does, that, does that make four? Yeah, and Hess, then you. Hess Ziegler. Uh, Sears. Sears and Worth. Okay. He comes in with Anthony Hopkins, who was going to play. So Nixon. Anthony Hopkins was at Brookings also. Oh sure. He was wow. here. He has it he has four people. I have four people. You know, he has Anthony Hopkins. Uh -huh. He has James Woods, uh -huh. who is going to play Halderman. Uh, and he has his researcher, Eric Hamburg, and says so he's got four, uh -huh. I've got four, uh -huh. and we have this uh, conversation. Hopkins is sitting next to me, and he has told me to call him Tony. Anthony Hopkins says, call <laughs> yeah, me Tony. Call me Tony. <laughs> so I say, Tony, note that here are four people uh, who are all were close to Nixon, and each one is telling you, is describing a different person. Ah. 
So you're going to wonder which one you choose. Uh -huh. But that's where we are. And then uh -huh. the, the Nixon. And what do you what do you ascribe that to? Was it just that, well, we Nixon? were. That's how we. What was Nixon? And that's how people responded. And all these people had different relations to him. And he uh, was sort of a different person with each. Of them. Well, you know, um, uh, John Sears, who was in the meeting, was very anti-Nixon at that point oh. and made that very clear. The one who, who, who told the best stories, strangely, uh, was Ron Ziegler. The, uh -huh. I say that because he's the only one who never wrote his memoirs. He was writing them, but he died before it. So we uh -huh. never know what he really would have said. But everybody was telling their Nixon stories. Uh -huh. uh, but they uh, painted their, four different images of oh, Nixon. Oh, yeah. And, and then Oliver Stone did something that was nice. I said, well, yeah, would you go upstairs uh, and and meet with uh, with the people who are the, the assistants and the secretaries of the young people and so forth and and talk with them. Uh -huh. So he and and and, uh, and Tony Tony they went, up, they went upstairs uh -huh. and we had a long cut. We talked about no politics, strictly about movies, uh -huh. and they were wonderful and we had a wonderful time. Uh -huh. And of course, having told them that you know this is all a big secret, uh -huh. then we got down the paparazzi were all over Outside. the place. Uh -huh. As we wrapped up our conversations in Steve's office, I wanted to probe just a little bit on his views about politics today. Steve is a lifelong Republican, so I was curious about his views about the state of the modern GOP and its current leader, Donald J. Trump. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. It's too grim. <laughs> it really is. I, I, the truth of, I would say this much. I have not changed my, resi my registration. There didn't seem to be any reason for it anyway. I lived in a register, always have, from Washington, D.C., where being a Republican wasn't going to give me any special vote anyway. Uh, sometimes I voted for Republican. Usually I, I didn't. I mean, I can remember when Obama uh, was running in the primary, and I had read his his book, and I loved it. And when I was going, going and when I went to the polls, I was going to vote for Obama. Of course, I was Republican. Well, it turned out that in the Democratic ballot, there was a place for write-in, but in the Republican ballot, there was no place. And I wasn't going to live, leave that polling place until I had an opportunity to put in my vote for Obama. Wow. And of course, that stopped everybody. They didn't know what to do. And finally, the, the one of the polling watch came over to me and said, all right, I took my ballot and threw it in the box and said, you voted, and, and I left. Uh, but there were times when I didn't want to be a Republican, but it was better uh, to, to stay that way. Uh, uh, over time, uh, what over time, when Trump ran uh, the first time, uh, what ran uh, before, before the primary, I did write one article uh, and I said, uh, you know, th this, this is the man that, that you would want as president. He has done nothing to do that. Uh, and I don't know, it was it was uh, USA Today or something. So I, I, I made my position. Then when he ran, when he got the nomination and ran for president, I did another article. Uh, this was a news Newsweek, and it said, this man is not a Republican. So I made my case mm -hmm. for, for him, uh, against, against him. him. Yep. Uh, and then he gets nominated and gets elected. And then there's the inaugural. I'd always somewhere given a commentary on the inaugural event. It's, I was always in some studio standing up commentary. This was my favorite speech. This was the speech when a, pres when a candidate becomes the president and he puts aside the candidate and he says something for all of the people. And I'm sitting there waiting for this from Donald Trump. And are you with BBC or? I forget who, which I was, because yeah. every time I would do it, whoever asked me first. And he gives the speech, this incredible speech in which he's learned nothing, another campaign speech. America first, America first. And I, I said, well, I don't think I'll ever say anything more. Because anything I say that some reporter will pick it up and said, Stephen Hess said something, Donald Trump, blah, blah. And then another reporter will say, I see that you said something, and then another. And I would have spent the rest of my days, old days, commenting on this. I said, there are plenty of people who will say these awful things that I feel about Donald Trump, but it's not going to be me. 
Right. So at that point, although commenting on television, so it was a fairly big part of my job at Brookings, I just stopped. At that point, I said to myself, I, I'm, I'm out of this. I have other things to do. Uh, I'll turn it over to other people. Right. Um, maybe that's an escape, but that's it. If, if I had answered that first question that came in on, on his speech, I know that some other reporter would pick up on that and ask me another question. And before yeah. I know it, I would be consumed by my reaction to Donald Trump. Or, or let this happen. Let my colleagues at Brookings, let their interns, let the, mm -hmm. the next generation take this on and deal with it. Their minds are fresh, they care just mm -hmm. as much about their country as I do, uh, and we'll go through that. So, but uh, are you, do you have any like hopes that things will change? Or? Things will always change. I, I remember I, we, when you start with history, you know that there are always been bad periods. You don't know how long they'll be, how long it'll take to get through yeah. Donald Trump. Taking me, it's taking us much longer than I expected, uh, but there'll be always people who'll be fighting for that, whether they fight within the Republican Party, fight within a third party, or fight with with within the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what can I say that the Republican Party has lie who is lying or is lying dead like Dodo right now that they are not responding to this man and this. this but that's I don't have to say that. Mm -hmm. That'll that'll be said by plenty of people. Yeah. If so if you if you you have this rich relationship with a Democrat named Daniel Patrick Moynihan, if you fast forwarded to 2023, could you see yourself having a close relationship with a Republican or a yeah, Democrat? If it, not necessarily me, but otherwise it would be hard to do it. In other words, the world that I lived in back then uh, in Washington, of course you traveled across party lines. Of course you you. You would have uh, uh, other people, friends of yours, to dinner. I can remember once we were at a dinner party, uh, and um, uh, Bobby Kennedy's aide was there at the same party, and so forth and so on. And he fell asleep because the Kennedys worked so hard all night, and we just let him sit there. And we went off into the next room and so forth. But he was there. And another time, I was at a cocktail party. I got a call, and it's Ted Kennedy's speechwriter, and he needs a joke. Okay, quick, give me a joke. Oh, okay, you want a joke? Here's a joke. So it wasn't like right. it is now. The horrible talk to a Ted Kennedy person, talk to a Bobby Kennedy It wasn't like that. Right. We, we all crossed party lines and so forth. Uh, there was kind of a mutual respect. Oh, I don't know with respect, but we were friends. <laughs> Fr frenemies. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, and the truth of the matter is, I don't have any. I, I led my life, which is going to be different than everybody else's life. I think back and I was incredibly fortunate and luck lucky. I hope everybody has that as well. Uh, but I, I'm not say, young woman, go out and work hard. You know that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I go, it, 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 that, that everybody will will adjust their lives to to what their prospects are and what their talents are, and we. I wish them well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've been so lucky for a number of reasons. I was lucky because of my parents. Mm -hmm. Everybody is not going to have parents who cared about them the way my parents cared about me. Right. I was unlucky that my father died when I was 13. But these things happen. You're lucky. You're uh, you're unlucky. I have uh, great hopes for this country, uh, and and the answer is very simple. I am an optimist. I generally always, when given a choice, think that things are going to work out and go well. And I've been so lucky that way. Talk about luck. I feel lucky to have met Steve, to have been mentored by him, and to call him a friend and a colleague to this day. Over the course of more than 60 years in his professional life, in and around American politics and governance, Steve has worked with notable people and contributed important ideas to our understanding of politics and government. He describes himself as a bit player and reflects that it all happened quite by accident. But wasn't it Seneca who said that luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity? My high school Latin days were a long time ago, but let's go with Seneca. And if that's luck, how to explain him working on two White House staffs and advising two other presidents, writing more than 15 books on American politics, history, and journalism, 
and doing important research and analysis as a senior fellow at Brookings for over 50 years. Among other accomplishments? Yes, in many ways, Steve has been lucky. But it also seems as if fate and skill aligned to make a life where one triumph built off the next. Maybe it wasn't quite by accident after all. I'm Katie Dunn Tempest. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to Quite by Accident, a podcast from the Brookings Podcast Network. I'm Katie Dunn Tempest at Brookings and the University of Virginia. I'd like to thank Kawili Lenny Huwanga, supervising producer. Fred Dews, senior producer. Gaston Robredo, audio engineer. Daniel Morales, video editor. Colin Crookshake, videographer. Katie Maris, who designed the cover art. And Tracy Vaselli and Adele Patton from Governance Studies. A very special thanks to my dear friend and colleague, Steve Pess. Additional support for the podcast comes from colleagues in Governance Studies and the Office of Communications at Brookings.